Okay. Um, I get to do the doctrine of salvation, or as Dr. Tanis, as Dr. Tanis told you not to call it in public, soteriology, from a Greek word meaning salvation. So his point was just, if someone knows what soteriology means, go for it, say it. It's kind of a cool word, soteriology. It's a lot of syllables, soteriology. Um, but, you know, don't do it just to sound cool. Doctrine of salvation, what the Bible teaches about how to be saved. My task is relatively easy because you've just sat through a whole hour on Christology, a whole hour on pneumatology. Christology, right there. Pneumatology, right there. And uh, pretty much in my theological algebra, you put together Christology and pneumatology, and you've got soteriology. Because um, this, this is a very theological way of putting it, obviously, as opposed to a spiritual, experiential way of putting it. Um, but that's what you are being equipped to be able to do. You guys are adding a whole skill set to your ability to think about Christianity that you can come at this doctrinally and say, what does it mean to be saved? What is salvation? To understand that, you've got all this stuff in place now that you can say, oh, well, that presupposes a particular view of who God is, what man is, what sin is, what the problem is, what the solution is, who is going to carry out this solution. It's the work of Christ on the mission of the Father and the work of the Spirit on the mission of the Father. Um, so all I need to do here is kind of put those two together, what Dr. Naidu and Dr. McKinley have already done, uh, and we will magically come up with soteriology. <coughs> Notice, uh, this is a diagram actually from my book, uh, The Deep Things of God. I think that it starts, theological reflection really starts in our experience. I don't mean our experience is the foundation of what we believe about God, but when you start pondering anything doctrinal at all, you start by knowing, I am saved. How am I saved? I am saved by Jesus. That's in that inner circle. It's sort of the, the thing you're most clearly aware of. Um, then you think one circle out there and think, well, if I'm saved by Jesus, how did Jesus bring about this salvation? I mean, if I'm saved by trusting him, what did he do to make salvation happen? And then once you answer that question, you ask, well, then who must he be if he's capable of doing the thing he did that brought about my salvation by trusting in him? And if your, answer to, if your answer is, he is a competent savior, therefore he must be somebody very special. In fact, he must be God to bring about what we're calling salvation here. Then you have to go further out and ask the question, oh, well, then who must God be if what I just said is true? If Jesus is God, what does this mean about who God is? Now, notice that's kind of the, I start here and uh, I throw the little pond of salvation into the ocean of, I don't know what, I, I'm just trying to go with something here. Um, and the little ripples kind of spread outward, the ripples of thoughtfulness spread out. You get to that. But if you put this in doctrinal categories, what you've got is there's a soteriology uh, in your experience of salvation. As you come to understand it, there's a doctrine of salvation as it becomes an intelligent, articulate experience of salvation. When you go from there to what must Jesus have done to make salvation possible, you're doing the doctrine of the atonement, that is the work of Christ. You go from there to the doctrine of the person of Christ, that he is God and man in one person. And then you go from there out to the doctrine of the Trinity. That is, if I say Jesus is God and I take that seriously, and I don't mean that in some kind of dumbed down heretical version of saying Jesus is God, but I actually really mean it, as we've been taught to mean it here, then the doctrine of God can't be unaffected. I've got to rethink it and say, if Jesus is God, he must always have been God and, God, and Jesus must be part of the definition of God. So God must be Father and Son and Spirit. That is, the doctrine of the Trinity is the um, rethinking of the doctrine of God made necessary by the deity of Christ. Yeah? Okay. Now, this is, this is nice in that it gets you out of mere experience into some theological reflection and gives you kind of a framework, but it's still very self-centered and even experience-centered. Now, partly that's legitimate, but once you've got the lay of the land, theology comes to the rescue and say, you can say, let me draw a better chart. I'm not at the middle of it. God is, and he is a gigantic triangle. <laughs> <laughs> not to scale. If I drew God to scale, you wouldn't be able to see the rest of it, right? So just imagine that's infinite. Um, so there's the Trinity. Then I've got the square there to represent the incarnation, where the second person of the Trinity, without ceasing to be who he was eternally, uh, the second person in fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, added to himself, took to himself, a complete human nature and a complete human experience, so that you have the incarnation of the Son of God 
God and man, then brought about the atonement, and then as a, an application of the atonement to my life, that brought about my salvation. Notice that your salvation got smaller and smaller. It didn't really get smaller. It just got put in perspective. Now, partly this is just getting your theology right, but getting your theology right really means coming to know God. And if you think you know God, but you've drawn a map with yourself at the very center of it, something still hasn't happened yet. You haven't kind of done the theological Copernican revolution where you realize God is at the center, God is bigger than me, God is more interesting, God has lots of things going on, and I am saved by coming into orbit of that central theological reality. So, Trinity big, you small, even your experience of salvation, small compared to God, right? Big compared to you not experiencing salvation, and this is big, I quit making whole sentences there for a minute. Me no make sentences. You, <laughs> you small, God big. Trying to, I've, been, I've been Twittering, right? So I'm trying to get this down to... Okay. Here's what I want to get. Um, in the Doctrine of Salvation, I want to make sure we get the size of salvation, the shape of salvation, and then our access to salvation. Um, and we'll do this especially by bringing out the role of Christ in the Spirit every chance we get. Okay, what is salvation? Uh, well, if you ask people what it means to be a Christian, they say something like, well, you know, I'm forgiven. I got my sins forgiven. That's a good answer. You could also say, I am born again. Yes, that is also a good answer. That is from John 3. Where is uh, forgiven from? Is that from a good Bible verse? Mm, Ephesians, uh, anyway, Galatians 2. Um, we'll move on from there. If, that's about as far as you'll get, actually. You'll get Christian, I'm a believer, I'm forgiven, and I'm born again. That's, that's roughly all we've got, right? That's all you kind of commonly hear in our, the way we allow ourselves to talk to each other. Um, but you could say, I am dead to sin and alive to God. That's pretty cool Romans language. Yeah, dead to sin, alive to God. You could say, chosen by God, holy and beloved. That's pretty nice language. Um, you could say, blessed with every spiritual blessing. That's getting closer. <laughs> that's, that's Ephesians 1, 3. That's, that's good stuff right there. Um, these are all appropriate ways to talk about salvation. I'm trying to point out that we're not improving on them, but we are coming up with more ways to say it. And that's just a virtue. If you find yourself tongue-tied and cliche-bound when someone asks you to talk about salvation and you say, you know, I'll go to hell and stuff. That's a serious problem, right? Being that inarticulate, lacking fluency in the ability to describe salvation is an actual problem. Um, oh, look at these. Well, what are those? Called with the holy calling, <laughs> joint heirs with Christ, a temple of the Holy Spirit, enriched in everything in Christ. Wow, that's pretty cool. Oh my goodness, what are all these? I... <laughs> called of Jesus Christ, called as saints, justified as a gift under grace, called into fellowship with his son, given the ministry of reconciliation. There are a lot of ways to describe this thing I'm trying to talk about doctrinally for the next hour, right? There's a bunch of them. This, uh, they didn't have PowerPoint back when I was a young boy, but um, this really comes from a Bible study I did when I was about 16. Uh, on my, uh, no, when I was 17. Uh, I got a Gideon's Bible and I thought, Bible? I already have a Bible. What do I want with this Bible? I know. I'll do a special Bible study with it. So I got an orange highlighter and I went through and underlined in the New Testament, uh, highlighted in orange in the New Testament, every reference that I took to be about salvation. Because I did a little self-reflection and thought, all I really know how to say is saved, born again, and forgiven. I want to know more ways to say it. I want to talk like the Apostle Paul talks. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a bad goal. You try it on and you feel kind of funny talking like that for a while, but that's okay. We all feel kind of funny talking like ourselves, and then we all go to college and reinvent ourselves, and we uh, grow funny mustaches, and we <laughs> dress weird, right? And, and um, that's okay. We're all just kind of trying to feel authentic, and, and I see some people dressing kids these days, these styles they wear. Every now and then I see someone dressed a certain way, and I think, who are you disguised as? <laughs> right? okay. I really, I almost asked this of someone in Panera the other day where I thought, I think that's hipster outfit, but it's beyond the pale. I mean, it's, this is no slam on hipsters. They're, that's fine. But this guy was really, I thought it was Halloween. <laughs> so it's, if you feel artificial, 
speaking the language of Canaan, speaking the spiritual language of the inspired Word of God, that's okay. Feel artificial for a while. Try it on. See if you can say something more than saved, Christian, born again, or forgiven. There are more than four things to say. And that's kind of what we're headed for here. The way to approach the doctrine of salvation is to get a catalog and then to get some categories. So fill your mind with more words and terms and ideas and images than you can handle and then come through and impose a little bit of order on it, put a grid on it. I think Dr. McKinley was doing something like that, right? Just the, the let me now give you more stuff about the Holy Spirit than you can think about. And everyone's scrambling to write it down. And he goes, no time for that. Let's move on. Here's some categories, <laughs> right? Um, now, there's more to study there, but a big part of what he was doing was giving you that impression that if you think the Holy Spirit's just... Uh, He's mentioned a couple times in the Bible in the verses charismatic likes and charismatics like, and that's all I know about the Holy Spirit. Then that kind of approach is to say, no, no, there's a whole lot of stuff. Same thing with the doctrine of salvation. There are many, many ways to talk about salvation. They're all right there, sitting on the surface of the pages of your New Testament. And so what I want to get tonight is both a catalog and some categories. I'll emphasize the categories. There's one, believer. <laughs> what are you? I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. We'll just pile them up here and we'll get a doctrine of salvation. Forgiven. What else? Going to heaven. Tamp that right down on top there. Going to heaven. Right? We'll have to talk about that one. You could call these all benefits of union with Christ. If you are in Christ, if you are united to Christ, there are benefits that flow from that. Going to heaven is one of them. Going to heaven is one of them. Okay. Saved. Chuck that on top there. Um, okay, this is an elephant. Here's what happens. Here's what happens if all you have are uh, the catalog items, but not the categories. If you don't have some sort of unifying vision to put them together, you guys, you recognize that as an elephant, but the funny thing is, it's not an elephant. Um, there's this story about the, uh, is it the seven blind men who encounter an elephant and then they all walk around it and feel different parts of it and describe it and one says, oh yes, I see that an elephant is much like a wall. And then one says, no, an elephant is like tree trunks. And no, he's like a snake. Anyway, then they all get together. I love this drawing because that metaphor, that little story is supposed to say all roads lead to the same place and we're all just describing partial things. And here's a poem based on it. So often theologic wars the disputants I ween, <laughs> rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. Well, I like this drawing because it shows that if you take those partial experiences and put them together, you don't in fact get an elephant, <laughs> right? That is not an elephant. I mean, it's a, kind of a cool statue if you were to actually make that, if you took a big brick wall and propped it up on pillars and gave it a fan and attached a snake to it. That would be the hard part. <laughs> um, a couple things are just inherently cocky and, and flawed about this analogy that, you know, oh, the religions, they're just like seven blind men who are all grasping and groping at the same thing and describing their partial truth and taking it to be the whole thing. For one thing, that story can only be told by a sighted person who is making fun of the blind people. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what you've got to be. You've got to be standing above the fray, able to offer a comprehensive vision of the whole thing and not helping the poor blind guys. Right? That's, so that's rude. Uh, it's really, it's mean. <laughs> it's, it's mean to the handicapped. Um, uh, and, and that's what people who take this, I'm above the fray approach to religion, that's what they're in fact doing, right? Everyone's blind but me and let me tell them what they ought to be doing. Um, but then the other thing is you don't in fact get an elephant. If you don't start with unity on something like salvation, you never get to unity. Right? You can't build it up piece by piece, here a wall, there a snake, there a spear. You've got to actually start with a vision of the whole thing. Like this. <laughs> I call this Packy, the salvation elephant. The soteriological elephant. You never, um, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but you can't get to the unity of what salvation is if what you start with is some partial experiences that you then cobble together and say, that's a soteriology, that's my vision of the whole thing. This is manifestly not a vision of the whole thing. It also suggests that Republicans are all saved. <laughs> okay, but now think about this. 
this could just be me as a theology nerd saying, hey everybody, it's my job to tell you, think big, think big, and that could just be my pet subject. I want to show you the actual spiritual danger you're in if you don't succeed in thinking adequately big, adequately holistically about salvation. If you don't take a comprehensive holistic grasp of the core of the Word of God and say, this is what salvation is. It has all these many parts. It has all these wonderful, splendid, different elements to it that I can explore. I can go over here and I can ponder justification by faith all by itself. And then I can go over here and ponder uh, Christ -like, uh, growth in Christ-likeness and spiritual transformation by itself. But they're part of one thing that I'm allowed to kind of move around and look at different facets of. If you're not able to do that, you're left with bits and pieces and parts, and here's what you'll do. You'll go to all this stuff that's in salvation and pick your favorites, right? So for instance, what if you come to me and say, here are my three favorite doctrines. There's a lot of cool stuff in salvation, blah, blah, blah. Look at that slide Sanders showed. But here are my three favorites. Once saved, always saved. Man, I believe that. Once saved, always saved. I also believe that perfection on earth is impossible. I mean, we're just totally depraved and we'll never be delivered from this until death, so you can't stop sinning perfectly. The third thing I know that I know that I know about salvation is that my future sins are already forgiven. Christ isn't going to die again for tomorrow's sins. Christ died once for all and all my sins are covered. Now, these three things might in fact be true. Um, uh, I think that they are all capable of being stated in a certain way that I could sign off on them and say, yes, I do hereby affirm these doctrines. But think about picking these as your three favorite doctrines. Do you know anyone who's got these as their three favorite doctrines? I, I, I knew some people like this. I don't know if they're still walking with Jesus or limping with Jesus or whatever you do if, <laughs> if this is your doctrine. This is a kind of a, um, uh, no, nope, I'm not going to say that in an inflammatory way. This is not so much a soteriology as a, a plan for backsliding. Right? In particular, if you come to me and say, say, theologian, are my future sins forgiven? I'll reply, gosh, I don't know. What are your plans for the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could have a dry theological conversation about the ground that has been uh, laid, the provision that's been made for sins committed in your future. But if you actually want to know and you're excited about the, uh, the pre-forgiveness of future sins, that's a problem, especially if it's bundled with an invincible... I can never go to hell because one time when I was nine, I walked the aisle and said some words. Right? That is a bad combination. Look what you're doing when you draw what you want to draw out of the whole bundle of what it is to be saved. You get that? How about the evil opposite of it? Um, those were some sort of jerk Calvinistic Baptists I used to know. I'm, sh I'm, sure I'm sure it's no reflection on Calvinists or Baptists currently. There's just a bad combo of them in the South. Uh, how about this guy? I only know three things about salvation. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. I like the whole slide Sanders showed, but here's what I know. Faith without works is dead. Number two, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And the third thing I know that I know is we have free will. Okay. I, these could all three be true. I, I can imagine a careful statement of each of these three points that I could affirm. <laughs> but taken together and in isolation from all the other things that are true of our salvation, that's not really a soteriology. That is a carnal self-improvement plan, right? This is like how I'm going to be as good as Jesus without any help from God. Yeah? And how you're in big trouble if you don't match me in the Holiness Olympics. Um, <laughs> so notice what's going on here. Without a grasp of the whole and a sense of what you are obligated to so that the person who believes these things is perpetually rendered blessedly uncomfortable by those things and vice versa, so that the whole thing, I almost called it the whole mess, but it's the opposite of a mess, the whole thing with everything in it is there uh, for you to understand. Otherwise, what you're stuck with is heresy, not in the sense of the kinds of heresies we've looked at in Christology, but in the etymological sense, the word heresy comes from the Greek word hieresis, selecting, picking and choosing. You can set yourself up for a certain kind of heresy, not by denying any Christian truth, but by just picking and choosing your favorites. Because if it's up to you to choose, who's in charge? Not God, not Christ, not the Word of God in Scripture. You are in charge of writing your own theological agenda when you pick and choose from among the many truths. So we've got to get beyond just a catalog to some of the categories, and especially we've got to get to the heart of what salvation is so that you can see how all the tendrils connect. Hearts don't have tendrils, do they? Hearts. They have like... Uh, arteries and 
veins, <laughs> arteries and veins. Got it. Okay. Um, we must pay close attention. As Hebrews says, we must pay much closer attention to this salvation brought to us in Christ, to what we've heard, lest we drift from it. If the message spoken by angels proved to be valid and binding, how shall we, in the new covenant, escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's the King James translation. Happy 400th birthday, King James translation. It was first spoken, this salvation was first spoken through the Lord and attested by the hearers to us. And God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I want to come back to the idea that we've got to pay attention and not neglect the greatness of this salvation. I put the rest of it in there because the Trinity is hiding in the rest of the verse. Oh, look at that. Spoken through the Lord, God bore witness, gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to make and sell a Trinity study Bible <laughs> only because I can make money on it. <laughs> I'm not going to teach other people to draw red triangles in their Bible like I do in mine. I'm going to sell it to them. I'm, a I'm actually not going to do that, yeah. Johnson House students already have red triangles all over their Bibles. Yeah. <laughs> Well, here's some of the catalog. Blessed, <laughs> blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with, in the heavenly places, in Christ with the full spiritual blessing or every spiritual blessing. If you look at Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, you then get Paul goes into catalog mode. So again, almost as if to overwhelm you, um, that God chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, destined us, predestined us for adoption as sons, freely bestowed glorious grace on us, redeemed us through his blood, forgiving our sins, made known the mystery of his will. God is enacting his plan to bring all things under the headship of Christ and sealed us with the spirit of promise. I say etc. there, not to say yada, 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 but to say there's more than you can fit on one tasteful PowerPoint slide in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. It's the catalog move again, right? Now we're going to get to the categories. Categories go under this heading we call an ordo salutis, another phrase you don't want to... Uh, impose on people. It's Latin for order of salvation. It's a logical order, not necessarily a chronological order. So you can get saved like that, bang, and uh, 25 things happen all at once, but they don't just land on your head in a jumble. There's a logical sequence within them. They all happen instantaneously sometimes uh, in, in, as a believer receives salvation, but nevertheless there is a logical order to them and I'm only giving you the basic categories here and then a kind of a book recommendation because you can have, well, each one of these is, uh, I have a one-hour lecture on every one of these, I think. I mean, they're all good. Uh, they're all wonderful biblical studies. Uh, and, and you can get into a good fight between denominations on almost any one of these, what, what sequence they go in. Like the fight over where to put regeneration, that's a big fight. But really cool. Election, uh, that is choosing, that God chose us. Effectual calling. Effectual calling is distinguished from um, outward calling. That is, an evangelist can preach the gospel to a room full of a thousand people and 300 of them get saved and begin Christian lives. Uh, what you say there is, the evangelist did the outward calling. He spoke the word of God in their presence. 300 of them were called by God and answered. Right, called and, and you can tell they were called because they answered, because the call of God went out and was effectual. Right? So, um, regeneration, that's the fancy word for being born again. Faith and repentance, I put them together with the and sign on purpose to show that they are two sides of the same coin, uh, that the saving faith and repentance of sins go together. Yeah. Um, effectual calling refers typically to an event in someone's biography uh, where they, uh, they, are, they encounter the Word of God, hear the voice of God in it, and respond. Yeah, whereas election is before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Um, justification, that is a legal, this is a legal metaphor, a legal declaration of uh, being righteous before God. Forgiveness, this is uh, having to do with your sins, that they are not held against you, but you are forgiven. Justification and forgiveness, very closely related, but distinct concepts. Another thing about an ordo salutis, an order of salvation, is there are different conceptual lenses sometimes to put on the same event. Adoption, that is to say, um, being, going from a state of not being children of God to being children of God, right? Passing from, uh, 
passing from not being in God's family to being made someone who is in God's family. Adoption. Uh, oh, boy. I'm not saying anything about any of these. Union with Christ we will talk about a little bit later. It's, it's to be placed in Christ and to get all the benefits of that union. Sanctification, in this, in this sense, being used as a process. It's kind of in typical usage in theological history. We talk about the process of growing in grace. And then final, uh, glorification. All these kind of go together. Lots of good books on these. Pick up any systematic theology and it'll have to take a position on where things go. One book recommendation, Sinclair Ferguson's book, The Christian Life, A Doctrinal Introduction. Yeah. This is a general one where I'm trying to get all the terms up there. Yeah. The biggest fight here, there's some things that are not contentious. They're just people talk about like, uh, there's a question of which is higher, justification or adoption. Sinclair Ferguson, for instance, says, adoption is a higher blessing than justification. Though, of course, any Protestant is going to jump up and down and get really excited about how awesome justification is. Sinclair Ferguson, with good Protestant Calvinist credentials, is going to say, but adoption is even better. It's a higher value. Justification just refers to your status, but adoption brings in the whole idea of the fatherhood of God and being a son of God in the place of Christ, and it gives some indication of the character of the life of the redeemed. Yeah. The most contentious thing is regeneration and faith. Um, some people would say, in order to get born again, you have to believe, right? If you believe, then you are born again. And other people would say, um, until you're born again, you don't have what it takes to believe, right? The old man can't repent and be born again and have faith. You have to be regenerated, and then the new man can repent and have faith. In that case, looking at regeneration that way, it would be an invisible thing that happens inside. So like the guy who hears the gospel of the Billy Graham crusade, on that view, God would reach in and sovereignly regenerate him. By exp he'd hear the word, he'd be born again, and then as a new creature, he would repent of his sins and believe in Christ. So the regeneration would be invisible. The other approach would be to say, he hears the gospel, he has faith in it, and then by the power of God, sovereignly, he is born again after having faith. So you, see the, you see the fight there, right? And both sides want to affirm the same kind of things. God's, uh, God's initiative and power in it, but the truth of the human response. Yeah, a lot of good fights to be had here. Instructive ones, not mean and nasty fights, but it, yeah. Okay, other questions? All right, I'm moving on fast. Here's another list, um, just to try to remind you over and over that the Bible does go into this listing mode to give you the catalog of all the things going on in salvation. It's just Romans 8.29. By just, I mean you're carrying it with you in your backpack, not ignore it. It's merely the Bible. Uh, but just with your senses heightened to what's going on here, listen to this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he, the Son, might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom God predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So, another classic passage for an order of salvation, um, and a lot of good theological digging down to do right here in this passage. So, Ephesians 1, Romans 8, great passages for the catalog of the elements that go into salvation. There's a big blue screen. What is that? Oh, I'm going to skip this. You guys know that stuff. Yeah. Okay, I'll do the short version of it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's very tempting to look at salvation as a transformation, whoop, transformation of um, the ideas in your mind, that Christianity is a set of doctrines to be believed and affirmed, or a transformation of your behavior, that Christianity is a set of ethical actions to be undertaken and a transformation of the practical life or of your affections, your heart, that Christianity is a right emotional response, an affective response to the grace of God. Um, and you can pick theologians and Christian movements uh, which emphasize one or the other. All of these are pretty cool uh, and significant, you can experience significant spiritual renewal moving from one to the other. So let's say you're, you're growing, you grow up in a church that is really emotional and completely gets the affective response to Jesus thing but you can't get anyone to answer two questions in a row. They'll always answer one, but when you ask the second one, they go, wow, you're an intellectual, aren't you? Right? Um, when you move from that kind of heart-based, pietistic, emotional Christianity, which is great, 
for what it is, but it's intellectually unsatisfying, and then you discover that there is such a thing as theology or apologetics, it can really put on a turbo boost on your Christian life to go, wow, there are things to know, there are reasons for faith, oh my gosh, everyone come over here and take apologetics classes. Or if you're a cold as ice, kind of a, I believe that Christianity is true because I lost a series of arguments and I am persuaded of the truth of this particular <laughs> claim, and then you discover you have a heart, right, <laughs> and that it's possible to love God and other people, significant spiritual renewal can happen there. And so as a result, what we can do is we can kind of stand in one circle or the other and yell at other Christians, oh, cold as ice intellectual Christians, come here to the social justice Christian circle. And then the others can say, oh, social justice Christian circle, we cannot tell you are Christian. Come out of that, <laughs> right, and, and make clear doctrinal affirmations. And th actually that traffic can be really good as we call to each other from different circles and experience some renewal. But salvation is in none of those circles. Projector, laptop. Um, salvation is in none of those circles, because you know what head, heart, and hands are. They're a whole soul, right? Tory education, that whole routine. I don't have to sell that to you. Head, heart, and hands are just, I mean, I can if you want. Tory education unites the head, heart, and hands. Okay. But it's just the soul. That's all we're dealing with. It's the soul of a man. You want a whole soul. You want your head, heart, and hands to be working together. You want them fully developed. It's what a liberal education is all about, is to make you bigger. Not physically, but... Um, but this is salvation. That's a big triangle, right? <laughs> this is, yeah, you can't, it just keeps going, right? This is just the business end of the life of God invading the soul of man. Now, notice, when the life of God invades the soul of man, um, it transforms everything about the head, heart, and hands, but it's bigger than any of the components of your soul can handle, right? So... That's what salvation is. That's what we're dealing with. So I don't want you to make the mistake of saying, must find the component of my soul which undergoes a certain transformation that I can point to and say, that is salvation. It won't fit in there. It's about somebody else being your salvation and coming to you, right? Big view of salvation. Section we're here talking about is the size of salvation. Trying to open our minds and say, let us not neglect this great salvation, but give attention to it and see it for what it is. It's big. It's in fact, I would say, how big? Like God big. Right? It's, it's God-sized. Um, Henry Skugel, a Scottish theologian, died in his 20s. He wrote a little book, The Life of God and the Soul of Man. Classic little book. Uh, Samuel Wesley gave it to George Whitfield, and George Whitfield said, I never knew what religion was till I read that book. And then, anyway, okay. Big category we have to get to. Um, I think this is a bigger category than all of the other things I showed you on the list. It's the doctrine of grace. Um, there are two basic ideas we have of grace when we, when we hear the word and think about it. One is God being nice or cutting us slack or forgiving us. Um, uh, so amazing grace, we tend to think, um, is the doctrine of God excusing us, unmerited favor, like we don't deserve it, but God excuses or forgives us. Another idea we have of grace, you get this elaborately developed in someone like Thomas Aquinas, is that it's God empowering us. So. Uh, boy, I don't think I can do that, but by the grace of God, I can do it, right? I don't mean if God forgives me, I can do it. I mean if God gives me the power to do it, then by His grace, I'll be able to do it. I think those are good, but partial, right? And so it wouldn't do any good to fight over the two. You'd want to try to find a larger perspective where you can capture both of them. Um, I think the largest possible definition of grace, the one that I think takes in as much biblical information as possible, is the idea of God giving Himself to us. And it's great sitting through the whole theology uh, conference again because I keep hearing all the other theologians saying stuff I was going to say and think, I should just cut that from my lecture. You've heard this before um, from, from the time Dr. Tana started talking. Grace is not God giving us stuff, but salvation comes from God giving us himself to be our salvation. His Tom Oden is a, a Methodist theologian who gives this largish definition of grace. Grace is an overarching term for all of God's gifts to humanity, all the blessings of salvation, all events through which are manifested God's own self-giving. Grace is a divine attribute revealing the heart of the one God, the heart of the one God, the premise of all spiritual blessing. Okay, that's Tom Oden. He's a great Methodist theologian. I was about to say the greatest living Methodist theologian. Yeah, that, that's probably true. 
He's a swell guy. Um, <laughs> and, and we can spend a lot of time unpacking this definition, but um, you, see, you see that what he's going for over and over in it is that grace is the overarching term and the condition of all spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1, 3 language. Let me show you what I mean by that. Even back in the Old Testament, what you've got is uh, the idea that the gospel, the good news of God bringing deliverance, is God giving himself to us for our salvation. The Old Testament way of saying that was, the Lord my God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is the psalmist way of talking. This is an Old Testament, before the New Covenant way of talking. Not God has made my salvation, not the Lord my God has sent somebody to bring about my salvation, but that he himself, Yahweh, the Lord himself in person, is my salvation, has become my salvation. Right? You see the difference there? He didn't do my salvation, cause my salvation, describe my salvation. He is my salvation. He has become my salvation. John Piper wrote a little book a few years ago called God is the Gospel. Um, and it's, uh, they're selling it in like truckloads now um, <laughs> for, for the season of Lent. Um, you can get, it says it's a small book. And the key idea is just that. Over and over, Piper does this simple way of presenting it where he says, it's not any of the things God gives you that is the gospel. Right? It's not even forgiveness of sins. This is an interesting thing for John Piper to say. Even forgiveness of sins isn't the gospel. If you think of it in the abstract and given to you separately from God giving himself to you. It's not about the gifts. It's about the giver. This is the nature of what Christian salvation is. Um, and this is where all the cliches come out, and, and we, need to, we need to coin some new cliches to be able to say this well to each other. It's, it's interpersonal, right? It's not God bringing about a set of things for you. It is God giving himself to you in those things. Uh, much more could be said, but I'd, I'd have to preach instead of teaching. Oh, this is a strange little cartoon. Uh, <laughs> I blame Ryan Agadoni for this cartoon. He's a Tory alum who works in the bookstore here on campus. Good cartoonist. Um, so Irenaeus, who you read in both houses, has this interesting little metaphor of the Son and the Holy Spirit being the two hands of the Father. Now, in some ways, it's a terrible metaphor, so I'm not worried that any of you are going to go home and think, that changed my way of thinking about God. I think he's a guy with puppets for hands. Right? <laughs> it's actually, it's such a bad image, there's no way you'll go wrong with it, because you'll always snap right out of it. But what Irenaeus is trying to get at with this image is um, everything God does, he does through the Son and the Spirit. So God the Father is always at work through the Son and the Spirit. And if you say, well, God didn't really show up. He just sent the Son and the Spirit. Irenaeus would say, what are those like remote control devices? No, they're the very hands of the Father. So the Father has a hold of you through the Son and the Spirit. Okay. Grace is God giving himself to us, uh, the Father working through the Son and the Spirit um, to, to give himself over to us to be our salvation. Question, how does God give himself to us? This is where you've got to think very particular. I started with a bunch of words. What I'm trying to do is get your attention so you don't just say, you know, saved. Because at the point of theology, we have to say, I, I kind of know what I mean by saved, but the fact that I don't, I'm not really able to say anything but saved should make you a little worried, not like maybe I'm not saved, but worried like, worried like, I'm going like, you know, maybe I'm not articulate about what this salvation is because maybe I haven't held myself to scripture to think particularly about it. Maybe I'm just using salvation as a kind of a poetic metaphor for being brought out of any kind of bad situation I can imagine, as opposed to holding my thoughts captive to the word of God to understand what it is that God has done. What is the problem that God thinks I have that God has brought about a particular kind of salvation? The big problem is I'm godless, and the solution is to be godded, or whatever the verb for that would be, right? <laughs> that God uh, gives himself to me to solve the problem of me being godless and estranged from him. So think particularly. This is not salvation of whatever kind from whatever, but a particular kind of salvation. Okay, now we're going to move even faster. The shape of the gospel, that's easy. Look, it's Trinity shaped. But you knew that was coming. Father, Son, and Spirit. There they are over there in this kind of interesting little picture I've been showing. Um, this, is a, this is from about 1100, I think. And it's an image of Christ on the cross with God the Father, though it's a Christ-shaped God the Father. It's a Christomorphic representation of the Father above him, gesturing blessing. And the dove of the Holy Spirit between them. We know it's not just a picture of the cross with a portrait of Jesus above it, because in between, you can see that it's labeled, this is enamel work, it's labeled Trinitas. Right? 
So it's you can see the little uh, green bar there with the gold writing on it, Trinitas, Trinity. The shape of salvation is that God gave himself. So just as salvation is God-sized, salvation is God-shaped. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, uh, John 3, 16, and then Galatians 4, 4, and 6. In the fullness of time, God sent his Son, born of a woman, then 4, 6. God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Notice the giving and the sending that's involved here. In order to bring about our salvation, God the Father gave the Son and the Spirit to us. That is, He gave the Son for us to die for our sins and the Spirit to us to be the gift of His presence indwelling us, right? So, just as in the Old Testament we said, God has become my salvation, in the New Testament, on the basis of the Gospel, this is unfolded to say, God became my salvation by being for me what he is in himself. He is in himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, and then he is to be my salvation, God the Father giving the Son and the Spirit for us and to us. You get the Trinitarian shape of that, right? Triangle's just a, an image for it. Uh, that's going on right there in Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I said spiritual because I'm kind of cheating. Uh, it doesn't say every blessing by the Holy Spirit who is the third person of the Trinity and I am intentionally making a Trinitarian reference. Um, I think that's the Holy Spirit right there. It's a spiritual blessing. Uh, I, could, I could show you big fat commentaries that agree with me, but I don't need it. We can just move on. Um, so, salvation comes about when the Father sends the Son and the Spirit. Now, think salvation history. Here's how this works out. Did the Incarnation happen to make Pentecost possible? One broad view of scriptural history is this. God the Father is sitting in heaven saying, you know what needs to happen? My Spirit needs to dwell in the hearts of men. But they can't handle it. They are not holy and they can't handle the holiness of the Spirit. So in order to get the Spirit into the hearts of believers, I'm going to have to send the Son down there to take human nature to himself, to take it to the cross, to purge it, to cleanse the temple, to make the temple ready to receive the indwelling of the Spirit. In this way, the work of the Son is a means to the end of the work of the Spirit. You see that? It's a really broad brush on salvation history, but it's an interesting way to think about it. Like the Trinity sitting in heaven going, uh, what really needs to happen here is the Spirit's work. So I, the Son, will now go do my work to make possible the Spirit's work. Because the end of God's ways is for the Spirit to dwell in the hearts of men. The Son makes that possible. That's one way of looking at salvation history. Here's the upside down version of it. Pentecost happened to extend and apply the incarnation. That is, Jesus Christ became incarnate, accomplished our salvation for us, but it was all wrapped up in Him. That is, He received the Holy Spirit, he gave the Holy Spirit. He was just walking around being the Holy Spirit filled one so that his baptism in the Jordan is kind of, in principle, Pentecost, a private Pentecost for one man, the one true man. But then when he dies and rises and ascends to the right hand of the Father, on the basis of his finished work, he sends the Holy Spirit who then applies the work of Christ to everyone who believes. So in this way, the work of the Holy Spirit serves the work of the Son. Now, which is it? Does the Son serve the Spirit, or does the Spirit serve the Son? Does Easter happen to make Pentecost possible, or does Pentecost happen to extend Easter? I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, I think since they're Trinity, I think it's, po it's not just sloppy thinking to say, this all goes together. I actually think that they are ordered to each other as means to each other's ends, because they are one with a unity greater than we can even imagine among created things. Because of the transcendent unity of Son and Spirit in the fellowship of the Father, the Son and the Spirit have works that are ordered towards each other's good. Right? Gospel of salvation is we're caught up in that. Right? That as the Son and the Spirit have this perfect sharing back and forth in the history of salvation, if we get placed in that, then we have the Son working for the Spirit with us in the middle, and the Spirit working for the Son with us in the middle, all on the mission and under the headship of the Father. Here's what you want to do then. If this feels like we're away back from salvation, there's a reason. Remember, soteriology comes from adding the work of the Son to the work of the Spirit. Christology plus, so, plus pneumatology equals soteriology. So I've got two columns here. One is a vocabulary that's appropriate to use for the person and work of the Son. 
Think back two hours to Dr. Naidu's lecture. The other column is the vocabulary relevant and appropriate for talking about the work of the Spirit. Think about the last hour with Dr. McKinley. So what do we say about the Son? He becomes incarnate. Spirit doesn't do that. He, takes, uh, he exercises hypostatic union. That's the big fancy word. You'll get it in, what, Cyril of Alexandria, probably? Maybe a little bit in Gregory Nazianzus. Um, that is to say, in his one person, or hypostasis, he unites two natures, divine and human. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Let me just contrast them and jump across the columns. The Son becomes incarnate. He becomes flesh. He, takes, he, he becomes a particular individual human man among us. The Spirit doesn't do that. The Spirit doesn't take on a body. The Spirit dwells within us. So incarnation is Son work. Indwelling is Spirit work. Hypostatic union distinguished from inspiration. The Son assumes a human nature. The Spirit enlivens a human person. Right, you get the distinction there? That the, the nature of Jesus of Nazareth, the man, is assumed into union with the eternal Logos. But the Holy Spirit doesn't come and become a particular person. He indwells and it brings to life lots and lots of individual persons without taking their place. And that's the thing. What the Son does is He replaces you. He substitutes for you. He bears your sins and He presents Himself to the Father as a substitute in your place. The Spirit doesn't substitute. The Spirit connects and relates. That's why uh, Dr. McKinley used the sort of bizarre metaphor of the coach, right? It's because Jesus comes in and says, get out of the game, I'm taking over, and plays the game for you and wins. Okay. The Holy Spirit does not take you out of the game, but gets into the game that you're playing and empowers you and moves you along to do it. We need both. We're that messed up, right? You actually need Jesus to come in and say, you can't handle this. Step aside. I'm doing it. And then, in a relevant place, subordinate to that, the Spirit comes along and says, you need to do this uh, not by yourself, but you need to be the one doing it. And so I am going to empower you to do it. It's two totally different modes. You could be thinking of your Christian life and say something like, Jesus needs to do both of those things for me. But this is a place where I want to say, don't be so Jesus-centered that you ignore the Holy Spirit. Right? There's a semi, it's not blasphemous, there's an irreverent article at theonion.com a website I cannot endorse nor recommend to the young people. <laughs> um, there's an irreverent article there that said, uh, Holy Spirit quietly being phased out of the Trinity. Right? And then it, so that was the headline. And then the copy said, um, it's really a reassigning of tasks because his job description was never quite clear anyway. <laughs> right? I mean, every, everything that people gave him to do, the son was already taking care of. So we're just phasing him out and we'll be the Benedy next year. So that's sad and irreverent. Um, but think about it. If every time you ask about something that goes on in the Christian life, your answer is always Jesus does it all by himself and I never have to talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's kind of hanging around your Bible going, uh, I actually have things to do. I actually have a job description. Like there's this whole column of things I do that are distinct, right? You actually don't want the Son working for your sanctification in the same way the Spirit does. Because what is Jesus' characteristic move? Get out of there. You can't handle it. Let me do it for you. Right? The Spirit's the one who can empower you to do the things. And they're not, they're not competing with each other. The Son of God completes a work, uh, completes redemption. The Holy Spirit applies it. The Son's characteristic work is all or nothing. You're not kind of justified. The Holy Spirit's work is gradual, partial, and with conflict. You're kind of sanctified. Right? And so both of these are going on. You might not have been able to identify them as two different entities. Uh, entities is a bad word. I'll just have to stick with persons. You might not have been able to identify them as two distinct persons uh, of the one God at work in your life. Why? Uh, I don't think you can distinguish the Son and the Spirit based on subjective feelings. Like when you get that whoa feeling like God's in the room, I don't think it comes with a whoa, that was the Son of God, or whoa, that was the Holy Spirit of God. Right? I, despite Pentecostal and charismatic friends who swear they can tell the difference by a certain <laughs> flutter in the diaphragm, I actually don't think you can tell the difference. I think the divine presence is just registered with us in that way, but not in such a way that you can do detailed Trinitarian theology on the basis of the powerful emotional spiritual response that you have. I think it takes Bible study in order to say the, the one who is present in the church today is either the Son or the Spirit or both on the common mission 
Uh, but it takes, like this is Bible study, this is not about, I felt that slightly up and to the right in my spiritual sensor, right? That's not how that works. Okay. So, um, what's going on with the Son and the Spirit is this two-handed salvation. I can't, I was going to do like some choreography for this, but I can't really. Um, there are some theologians who talk about the two missions. Oh, we could, we could get something going. We could do orientation this way, right? Uh, it's probably too late now. There's some theologians who talk about it as the two missions, the mission of the Son and the mission of the Spirit. You could also call it one twofold mission, right? That what the Father sends, missions, is the Son and the Spirit together in distinct but coordinated ways. So that even the incarnation, only the Son becomes incarnate. But how does the Son become incarnate? He is conceived by the Holy Spirit. He is empowered by the Holy Spirit. He is the Christ, the Anointed One with the Holy Spirit. So that even when you're looking at Jesus, you're seeing the person of the Son wrapped up in the person of the Spirit, right? Not that the Spirit became incarnate, but the Spirit was not absent from the incarnation. That's not too subtle, is it? It's like this. Okay. Um, I got to move on here. One more thing, uh, one more Trinitarian way to view salvation to get the big picture. Can you tell I'm using the Trinity as the key to the doctrine of salvation? Is that pretty evident, right? If we, what we want is a big picture of salvation that is holistic, so we're not picking and choosing, the answer is to get the Trinitarian view of salvation because it all comes in one God-sized package deal. Yeah? Here's how salvation happens, right? There's the uh, eternal son becomes the incarnate son. That's you. Woo! <laughs> when you get in that line, you're saved. Who puts you there? The spirit. The spirit of adoption places you into the relationship of sonship. Sonship has been in heaven all this time in the eternal being of God. In the incarnation, sonship goes from being eternal sonship to also being incarnate sonship, which makes possible adoptive sonship. I apologize to the ladies in the room. You also are sons of God. Why does that matter? I could do the inclusive translation and say son and daughter of God. And, and this is the contact you've got to get, right? Jesus was the son of God which made it possible for me to be a son of God. It's really valuable, I think, for women to stick to that son language and make the little adjustment. You know that, what, what, what hymn did we start with, Be Thou My Vision? I sang this a few weeks ago beside a, a woman who sang, um, Thy my true father, I thy dear daughter. <laughs> which didn't rhyme. Um, and my first thought was, that's kind of sweet. She's personalizing it. I like that. My second thought was, Mm, it doesn't rhyme. Uh, my, third, <laughs> my third thought was, I hope, she he I hope she knows that she is a son of God in the son of God. Right? I hope that doing the daughter thing to extend it to herself and personalize it and own it, which is good, didn't make her miss out on the fact that we're all sons in the son. Right? So don't miss that. Um, just like uh, I'm, I'm a pretty manly guy, but I have to be the bride of Christ. That's awkward, right? So it's... <laughs> It's awkward for all of us, but I'm not going to let go of the bride metaphor just because it doesn't seem to speak to me as a man. I want to be the husband of Christ. Right? Right? You see how it would cut against the logic of the biblical metaphor? All of us, men and women alike, are sons of God because we are affiliated, filius, son, we are affiliated to the sonship of Jesus by the spirit of adoption. The Greek word is son-making. Right? Adoption is kind of a gender neutral word that's appropriate in our language. All right, that was a little too much. Um, four and a half minutes. Here's what we're going to do. That's Jesus getting baptized, John the Baptist pointing to him. I don't know why. <laughs> There's the saving life of Christ. It's just stick figures. You've seen it before. All this stuff's going on. Jesus is born, he's baptized, he lives, dies, rises again, and ascends to the right hand of God. Yeah? That was it. All right. Here's what you got. This is in Calvin. Calvin 216. <laughs> Institutes, Institutes 216. <clears throat> John Calvin looks at that life of Jesus and says, that's where salvation is. It's all right there in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you've got salvation. Here's how he says it. Our whole salvation and all its parts are comprehended in Christ. If we seek any gifts of the Spirit, they will be found in His anointing, His Christing, His, His anointing. If we seek strength, it's in his dominion. Dominion, dominus, it's Latin for Lord, right? Our strength is in his lordship. In pu if purity, it's in his conception, conceived by the Holy Spirit. If gentleness, in his birth, born of the Virgin Mary. Notice that this is the Apostles' Creed, right? 
um, Christ the Lord conceived, born. If we seek redemption, it lies in his passion. If acquittal, in his condemnation. If we seek remission of the curse, it's in his cross. If satisfaction, in his sacrifice. If purification, in his blood. If reconciliation, in his descent into hell. If mortification of the flesh, in his tomb. If newness of life, in his resurrection. If immortality, in the same, his resurrection. Notice, this is the standard move. Salvation is in the life of Christ. You need to be placed into it. That's where all the benefits come from. Notice also what's going on here is that list, the catalog. It's coming along again, but it's all centered in union with Christ. All right. Oh, I can skip this because McKinley did it. Woo, look at that oil. Whoa. That's cool. Oh, there's you getting saved. Whoa, I'm saved. Whoa, right there. 1 Corinthians 1.30, by God's doing, you're in Christ. Uh, King James Version says, of him are you in Christ. Right? By God's doing, you're in Christ. Who became for us, here comes the catalog, wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All right, I'm going to skip that. I got one more thing to do here. Oh, man. No, no, it's all, it's all good, but here. Last thing, no, is that what I'm going to do? Yeah. Last thing I'm going to do. When is salvation? Because once you've got the catalog, once you've got the categories, once you've got the Trinitarian framework that keeps you from heretically picking and choosing your favorite bits and pieces from salvation, once you've thought that big about it, it starts to give you some weird optical illusions. Like, when was I saved? Was I saved? Uh, one guy used to give his testimony. I was saved uh, 2,000 years ago, a little bit outside of Jerusalem. No, no, I get what you're saying. That's very cute. That's when we were all saved, right? <laughs> But I wanted a story from your biography, not the tale of salvation history. Um, so there is a sense in which we were saved. You know the old song, were you there when they crucified my Lord? When I was a kid, I would always say, no. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. There's got to be some spiritual sense in which I had to be there in Christ, um, in, because that's where salvation is. It really was 2,000 years ago, a little bit outside of Jerusalem, and yet, I experienced salvation at some later time in the 1970s, a much, a much worse time. Right? Um, on the other hand, I seem to have been chosen before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1. On the other hand, I, salvation seems to be a pass card that I'm going to keep a hold of until Judgment Day, because when Judgment Day comes down and everyone's in big trouble, I get to show the pass card and go, I get out of Judgment Day free, right? right? So saved seems to me mean partly a down payment on Judgment Day will go right for me. Since I know that, I experience salvation now, ahead of time. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, right? This is, it goes on, uh, you just have to think that big about salvation and then work your way around all the implications of it. That's, that's 10 o'clock, that's what it is. Um, so here's the last category I want to give you to, to make sense of the categories. Here's the last, uh, the, to make sense of the catalog of blessings. Our salvation, that it happened long ago, accomplished in Christ, and it takes place in our biographies here and now, with the Holy Spirit applying redemption, it's again part of this large Trinitarian structure, which is to say, the Father put all the blessings of salvation in Jesus Christ, in His life, death, and resurrection. The Holy Spirit brings them to us and makes them available to us now, so, so that the redemption accomplished in Christ back then by the Son is applied fully to us now by the Holy Spirit. That's how the whole package goes together. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.